Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be with you at uh, New Chance Camp and to see so many yellow shirts. Wow, it's a privilege to see you guys. So whatever you do, be real quiet when you do it, okay? Be real, real quiet because we want everybody to pay attention to what we're saying. Last night, we talked about the, the uh, attack of the enemy and how to have a defense and how to uh, defend ourselves and be prepared for those attacks. Today, I want to f point out the difference between hearing the voice of God and hearing the accusation of the devil. Have you ever had difficulty sometimes, not every time, but sometimes not, be sure, not being sure if is it God speaking to you or is it the enemy speaking to you? Have you ever had a bad day where everything goes wrong? Uh, flying here, it seemed like everything went wrong. I had to fly from my home in Missouri to Sacramento. And then from Sacramento, I had to fly to Orlando for other meetings. And that plane and flight was delayed. I had to, put on, I had to buy another ticket, fly one way. Then I think, okay, the worst is over. Oh, no, it's just beginning. <laughs> From Orlando, I had to fly to Phoenix to fly to Anchorage. And our first flight was delayed, and I missed the second flight. So I'm running to the gate, and the door is closed. Oh, you can imagine how much praise was on my lips to God for that. And the enemy was beating me up. <laughs> look, you're being faithful to God, and look what happens. And I ran so hard, I go to the... Um, to get my ticket reissued on another flight. You have to fly through Seattle. Go to that gate. So I run back to where I came from. I go to the gate. And the gate is still open. Oh, no, no. You have to go back because it, we're not going to make it on time to do your ticket over again. And so I went two hours later on another flight, which brought me into Anchorage, 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, joy. <laughs> And you know what? During this time, I said, I'm not going to complain. I'm going to give you praise. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My mouth shall speak of the wonderful things that God has done. And I want to thank Pastor Sergey because he had to wake up in the middle of the night to bring me home. Give me, let me have a good night's sleep yesterday morning. <laughs> and so last night, you probably couldn't tell, but before I had to preach, I just wanted to go sleep in bed. I felt so weak. I felt so unspiritual. But I said, I'm here, God. Give me strength. When I got up to speak last night, the power of God came all over me, and I felt energy that I didn't have before. That's God. That's God. Now, I wanted, so last night I prayed what word God gave me, a word I did not expect. And it was for you and for me. This morning, I prayed this morning, what word did I give this morning? And he wants me to speak about the difference between condemnation in the red letters and conviction. Na ruskom, asuždjenja i Obličenia, obličenia. So, condemnation, what is condemnation? Let's, let's, let's hear and learn what is to be condemned and what is it to be convicted. Or another word in English that we use is to be convinced. Convinced. So let's look to the Word of God and chapter 8 of John is a wonderful example of who is condemning and who is convicting and the purpose and the outcome and the result. So John chapter 8 verse 1, it says, Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives. And then verse 2, early in the morning, he came into the temple. And all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Oh my goodness, what would Slavic people say about a preacher who sits down to preach? <laughs> but Jesus did it. I'm standing, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so can you picture the, 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 
the scenario. It's at the temple, but they had a courtyard. And a lot of people came into that courtyard and Jesus began to teach them. In the middle of the teaching, verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and they set her in the midst. Now, adultery in the law of Moses, I'm just telling you, was punishable by death. If you were caught sleeping with someone else's husband or wife, the penalty was death. I don't think a lot of people did that knowing they would die if they did that. Now, verse 4, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. And then they give us a detail in the very act. I don't know how they knew that. I don't know how they caught her. How could they have walked in on this scenario? It's in the Bible, so I'm not embarrassed to talk about it. Now, verse 5, they're using this woman, her sin, evidence that she was guilty to kill her or put Jesus in a corner. So they're quoting the Bible, the law, the word of God. Now Moses in the law, the law of God, he commanded us that people who do this such should be stoned. But what do you say? Do you see? Shh, 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 shh. No talking. Talk quietly. Write in your notebooks. Are you listening? Shh. Guys, not too loud. Now, verse 6 tells us the motivation of them bringing this woman. Did they care about the law of Moses? Not so much. <laughs> Did they care about this woman? Not at all. What was the purpose that they brought this woman actually guilty, actually caught? Well, verse 6, John tells us. And they said this, testing him that they may have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus does something interesting. Now, we're going to read in a moment that Jesus stooped down in the dust and he wrote something with his finger. But you're going to discover in the next couple of verses, he did this two times. Watch what happens the first time that Jesus writes something, then he gets up and says something, then the second time, Jesus writes again. But there are different results when he writes the first time and he writes the second time. And we can only guess what he wrote. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we can only guess. I'll tell you my guess. Again, it's only a guess. But I think it's probably the right guess. So let's read what happened. When Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground the first time. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear them. Jesus ignored them. Jesus didn't say anything until he wrote something. When he wrote something on the ground the first time, verse 7 says, they continued to ask him. Ask him what? What do you say? What do you say? Come on, Jesus. What's good? What are we going to do with this lady? She's caught. She's guilty. Kill her. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, he was without sin among you. You throw the first stone. It seems like they had stones in their hand. It seems like they were ready to kill her. Oh, <laughs> We love to kill other people who are sinners, right? We love the law just as long as not for us, for somebody else. And so they're ready to kill her, right? The stone is probably in their hands, even though it doesn't say that. And then in verse 8, he stoops down. And he writes something the second time. Before we read verse 9, 
let me tell you ahead of time. What he wrote the second time closed everybody's mouth. What he wrote the second time had such a chilling effect that people started to leave. Later we're going to discover that everybody left except Jesus and the lady. But they didn't leave all at once. They left one at a time. In any particular order? Yes, that's another detail. How did they leave? They left with the oldest first, the next oldest, and next oldest. But verse 9 tells us in one of the translations, not in every one, those who heard what he said, and I do believe what he wrote, they were convicted of their conscience. Let's just take a minute to say, what is a conscience? A conscience, says the Bible in Proverbs, it's the lamp of the Lord. It, show, it shines a light into the dark places, not of our muscle of our heart, but of our mind. And it brings truth. The conscience tells us, no, what you're doing is wrong. Everybody in the world has a conscience. Does everyone's conscience work properly 100%? And the answer is no. You see, in the beginning, it works well, like a sharp knife. But if you take a sharp knife and you dull it on metal or a stone, and you don't sharpen it, you don't, you don't take care of it, the edge will become round and dull, just like a conscience. But here, the conscience, it worked. And so they started to leave one by one, beginning with the oldest to the last. Finally, Jesus was left alone and the woman standing there. Jesus raised himself up from writing the second time. And he didn't see anybody, not even the people he was teaching. The Bible says he saw no one but the woman. So then he asks her an interesting question. He said, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Then he says another word. Has no, excuse me, has no one condemned you? Verse 9 talks about conviction of the conscience. And verse 10 talks about condemnation of the people or of the enemy. Has no one condemned you? And she answers in verse 11, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her these beautiful words, neither do I condemn you on this condition. Go and what? And what? I can't hear you. Don't sin that sin anymore in your life. You're forgiven. So the question, there's a couple of questions here. I'm not going to take the time. In a classroom, I, I ask these questions and students take, uh, take part in the discussion. But to save time, I'll give you every answer that I think. Now, you may disagree with me. It's good because I'm making what's called an educated guess. This is what I think he wrote. This is what I think happened because we are not exactly told. Do you understand that? I'm going to give you an opinion. You can accept it. You can reject it. But the main thing is what God does to convict us and what the enemy does to condemn us. That is clear in the passage. So question number one. Why did they bring just the woman? Can a woman commit adultery by herself? The answer is no. Where is the man? Ladies, are you with me on this one? How unfair. What a double standard. Kill the woman and let the man go free. He is just as guilty as her. Now, if they didn't bring the man, here are the possible Reason, possible, I don't know. Number one, he was 
one of the guys who planned this to sleep with her. They let him go, and now they're going to use her to accuse Jesus. Talk about hypocrisy. Here you're raising up the law of God, and you're causing the man and the woman to break it. That's even worse. Secondly, another possibility is it was just a regular guy and the Pharisees saw them go into this house or room and now they're in the window waiting for the water to boil. <laughs> and then they break the door and catch her and let him go. That's another hypocrisy. Like, what are you doing? So what did he write the first time? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Because they did not react and they kept on asking him, I think Jesus wrote down what they were saying. The commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He wrote that. I think that's what he wrote the first time. No adultery. It's a wrong. It's a sin. And they're like, yeah, you're upholding the law. Wow, we're going to make him kill her instead of forgive her. Then Jesus stands up and he says what John tells us. He said, okay, whoever is without sin, you can kill her. You can judge her. But he didn't give them time to answer or throw stones. He stooped down. He wrote the second time. I believe you can disagree. I want to make sure of that. It's a speculation. It's a guess. I believe he wrote a name and a sin. Yasha with the prostitute Shalomita Friday night. And Yasha, the oldest guy there, he sees his name. Jesus knows, drops a stone. And Yashinka tak tichonyechka pashol sebie. Jacob, when he sees his name and the sin, oh, if my wife finds out, she'll kill me. Never mind the stone. She'll stone me. <laughs> Others are watching. And then another name and another sin, maybe a different one. And one by one, why the oldest to the youngest? Okay, stop right there. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. You remember the story of Jason, J Joseph who was sold by his brothers? Yes? So when they sold him and after a long history, after a long story, Joseph tells Pharaoh the dream, he's rescued from prison, he becomes a number two ruler in all of Egypt, right? Now he's clean shaven, no beard, now he's speaking Egyptian, now he's in government, now he's a government official, number two in the country, he has the ring of Pharaoh, and ten Hebrews with beards come from their father, Jacob, his brothers asking for grain and they don't recognize Joseph Joseph sees them and in his heart he forgives them Joseph wants to save them Joseph wants to recognize them Joseph wants to see his father and his blood brother Benjamin and so then he says you will eat with me and this is the story I want to bring out the Bible says that Joseph had them eat at a separate table because Jews do not, do, Egyptians don't eat with the Jews. Ah, talk about different discrimination. And he put them from the oldest, next oldest, next oldest, 10 in a row. Mathematically, it's impossible. Yeah, he could look on the face and somebody could guess, but if they're a year apart or two years apart, like, Usually the mothers had babies a year or two years apart. It's hard to tell who's the oldest and the next and the next and the next. But Joseph knew his brothers. Joseph knew the details of their life. And as a result, because of what he knew about them, Joseph put them in order because he knew the details. Come back to Jesus. Jesus writes what he wrote and the oldest left, the next oldest left. I want to ask you a question. When does a Jewish person stop arguing? <laughs> Almost never. 
They're right and you're wrong. They're smart and you're not. But what Jesus wrote was so powerful that they said, and left, right? Now, one last question, then we'll go on to our lesson. Did Jesus break the law of Moses? Yes or no? How did he not break the law of Moses? The law said that if you sin that sin, you must die. Yes, he was merciful, but that's not the question. In fact, the Pharisees knew that he was merciful. But Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So legally, righteously, according to God's law, how did he not break the law of Moses? I'll give you the answer. Jesus asks her a legal question. He says a legal, L-E-G-A-L. You can spell it, but right in your notebook, legal. He asks her, who are the people who are the witnesses who accuse you? Lord, there's nobody here. I can't condemn you. The law of Moses said you'd need two or three witnesses to put somebody to death. Yes? yes. Hallelujah. Man, Jesus is so smart. He writes something that everybody scrams. Everybody goes, whoosh, whoosh, I'm gone. Like Roadrunner. Beep, beep. They're gone. And he says, I can't condemn you. Ma'am, go. Don't sin again. Don't do that again. And he released her. One more detail, and I loved. Who gave the law to Moses? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Who? God. But you know, the New Testament tells us it was Jesus. How did God give the law to Moses? What did Moses bring down from the mountain? Tablets of what? Stone. So how was the law written on the tablets of stone? How, 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 how? Huh? By the finger of God. When Jesus knelt down on the ground and he wrote, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know what he was saying to the Pharisees? I wrote this law. <sighs> I am the Lord your God. I am who I am. I was there. He said, no, before Abraham was, I am. I was before Abraham's time. I was before Moses' time. And I, the Lord God, I wrote this to preserve your life, to keep you from sinning. It was my finger that wrote the law. Hallelujah. What a powerful story, no? Is it the desire of God to kill life or to preserve life? Preserve life. So the law that brought death, the main purpose was not death, but it was life to keep you from adultery, to keep you from harming others with your immorality and yourself. Did you know that intimate physical love with another woman, intimate physical love with another man is a gift of God to married people, one man with one woman for life. It's the gift of God. It's a blessing in marriage. But the world, and especially Satan, he wants to take something beautiful, something good, something that God gave to Adam and Eve when he said, you shall leave your father and mother, you shall be joined to your husband and wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That was a gift from God. That was God's heart in marriage. But Satan wants to destroy that. 
Do you know you could take the, uh, 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 an example, fire. Is fire good or bad? Both. Fire is good. Listen, listen, listen. Fire is good if it burns in the right place. Like a fireplace. Yes? Like in your stove through the pilot. Yes? Like at a campfire that has stones around it. And you burn the wood for light, for warmth, right? To keep animals away. Fire is a good thing. Except when fire burns outside God's intention. If you put a fire right here in the middle of this carpet, the carpet will burn. The sheetrock will burn. This building will burn. And fire never has enough. Proverb tells us that fire, just like sexual sin, it never has enough. Give me more. I want more. As, as much as you feed fire, it will burn it and it will burn more. Fire is never satisfied when it's out of control. So here is a good thing that could be used for bad, for harm, for danger and destruction. And so this gift of married love, outside of marriage, it'll burn you down. This gift of physical intimacy, when you're single with various partners who are not your husband or wife, it will burn your conscience. It will burn your mind. It will burn your nerve endings of your spirit. It will damage you. I wasn't planning to say this, but I have to say this. Imagine, if you can, two pieces of paper. These are hands. This is not paper. But I don't have paper, so this is one sheet of white paper. This is another sheet of white paper, okay? Two separate pieces of white paper. What if I put Elmer's glue or carpenter's glue on one sheet and I glue the two pieces of paper together? The two pieces of paper are now joined together. Are you following me, right? The glue dries. Question, is it easy to peel one sheet from the other? Yes, no. What happens? Exactly, young person. Exactly. And that's what happens in the marriage act of intimacy. When you marry someone, when you are together with that person physically, that act is a glue. And your heart and their heart. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, and I'm not going to go into detail because we have a mixed audience. You are joining yourself with another person and gluing yourself to them. And it was never intended to be separated. And when you separate by divorce or by multiple partners or by sin, you're ripping your soul. You're damaging your conscience. You're hurting your heart. You're ripping the fabric of health in your spiritual life. Is this make sense to y'all? <laughs> y'all. <laughs> We're in Alaska to use guys. <laughs> God never intended for this gift of intimacy to be misused. And that's why he put a strong penalty. But God doesn't want to destroy you. God wants to bless you. And when we obey God... And when we wait until we're married, and when we love one woman and one man for life, that is a joining that is never meant to be torn apart or ripped apart. And when it does, our hearts tell us it's wrong. Now let's go to the next slide, and let's talk about these two words. Now if you're taking notes on a fresh piece of paper, make a line right down the middle of your paper. And on the left side of your paper, I'm pointing for your left side, put the word condemnation. And on the right side of your paper, put the word conviction. 
What is the difference between condemnation and conviction? We will find, I think, seven or eight differences. One is from God, one is from Satan. And really, this lesson this morning is to redeem you from the curse of condemnation and bring you to the place where the Holy Spirit actually does something different. He speaks to your heart not to kill you, but to set you free with the truth. So what is the definition of condemnation? It's a sentence of death. In a courtroom, when you are judging somebody of murder, capital crime, the judge is sitting, right? And the prosecuting attorney who's accusing has to bring evidence. You have to have witnesses and you have to have evidence. Did John Smith kill Mary Smith, his wife? Did he murder her? If he did, who saw it? What DNA? What witnesses? What evidence? And when the evidence is brought, then the judge or the jury of 12 people, they bring a sentence. A sentence is a punishment. And so then they stand up in the courtroom. What have you all decided? We, the jury, find John Smith guilty of murder in the first degree. And then they give the sentence, which used to be death by the electric chair, by hanging in some countries, by firing squad, and by a needle where they put them to death. Oh, no, that's terrible. Put them in jail for the rest of their life. That's what they do. When... A building inspector comes into a building and he finds that the building could fall down. He says, no one could go into that building. He puts a red notice. This building is what? Condemned. You have to tear it down. You have to destroy it. And that's what the devil wants to do with you and with me. He doesn't care about God's law. He'll use it to condemn you. He doesn't care about the people he'll destroy. He'll destroy them and he'll destroy you. But God, he wants to uphold what is true. Mr. John Smith, did you commit this crime? And if you did, there are consequences. Do you know the two thieves on the cross next to Jesus on the left side and on the right side. They were criminals. Were they guilty or not? Yes, no. They said they were guilty. In the beginning, both of them said, how you, Jesus, in the middle there, you're a king. If you're a king, call your soldiers. Get us down from this cross. They mocked and laughed until Jesus started to pray. And Jesus used truth. To convict the heart of one of them. I don't understand why the second one didn't confess. It could be his heart was too hard. And as one of the thieves saw that Jesus was praying. That Jesus was ready to forgive sin. He made a confession. He said we are guilty. And we must die. But he knew he's going from one life to the next. And he believed. He said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, the eternal kingdom, remember me. Do you know, he didn't even say the word forgive me. He didn't say the word I repent. He didn't explain the details of why he's on the cross. But his heart was broken because he saw an innocent man and he believed he was the king. He was the Messiah. And Jesus saw his heart. He forgave him. Jesus said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And this man believed. And truth penetrated his heart. Now the other thief. I want to ask a silly question. How far apart were the crosses? I don't know. <laughs> Five feet? Ten feet? hundred feet I don't think a hundred feet they were pretty close to one another but that's not important 
The important thing is that here's a man, the second thief, who didn't repent. He's going to die in a few hours. Yes, no? Yes. He's going to die. He's guilty like the first guy's guilty. He hears the confession, admission, and he hears Jesus forgiving him. My thinking is, dude, what do you have to lose? You're going to die. What if he is the king? What if there is a heaven? What if there is forgiveness? Ask him, ask him, Lord, could you forgive me too? Maybe Jesus would say, you have to be really repentant like the first one. I don't know. And he died 5, 10, 15 feet away from the Savior of the world. How about you? You're in this room, but being in this room won't save you. Jesus is here. He's not on a cross. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. But Jesus is here. Where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is here. And you would not want to be forgiven? And you would not ask him to be forgiven? And you're going to live your life? And you're going to let fire burn your life because it's fun? Because it feels good? You're going to be with that boy? You're going to be with that girl? And you're doing the wrong thing and you know it. But today, Jesus said, if you repent, if you say, Jesus, forgive me, I am guilty, he will forgive you because he took your penalty. He died so you and I, I'm not better than you, that we could live. Oh, man, that's so cool. <laughs> now, what is the main difference between condemnation and conviction? Number one, condemnation is from, oh, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. You got ahead of me there. Go back, go back. Yeah, there we go. Right there. Go ahead. Satan. Satan is the one who accuses. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, the Holy Spirit calls him the accuser of who, ladies and gentlemen? Does he accuse the sinners? No. Does he accuse the people outside the kingdom of God? No. No. He doesn't have to. They're outside the kingdom. Who does he accuse? Who does the devil accuse? People in the church. <laughs> the brethren, men and women. That's, a, that's both, both uh, genders, man and woman. And he accuses them, what, once a month? Once a week? Once a day? Nope. Day and night. Here's what the enemy does. Let's say chocolate cake. You're on a diet. You can't have any sweets. And you see chocolate cake. Ay, 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 ay. Chocolate cake. And the devil says, go ahead. You like it. You want it. Yeah, yeah. Just, just put your finger. Okay, just a finger. Whoa. Okay, just one more. One more time. But somebody's going to see it. Do it on the bottom. Nobody will see it on the bottom. Uh, just have a little one bite. Just one bite. Well, you took a bite, you might as well have half of it. Leave half for the other half. Well, you ate half. Eat the whole thing. <laughs> and then afterwards, what? You feel good about it? You feel guilty, right? And then he says, what kind of a diet person are you? You're supposed to be on a diet. You're such a hypocrite. You wanted that chocolate cake. You put your finger. Yeah, but you told me to. Yeah, join me in hell forever. <laughs> He knows his end. He knows he will be in hell forever. And he wants company. He wants you and he wants me. But I'm not going there. Neither are you. He will tempt you. He will put his foot out so you fall. And then he points the finger. Look God at your Christian here. But thank God for Jesus Christ who is our lawyer. Thank you for Jesus Christ who stands next to me and says... His penalty I took on myself. Hallelujah. See, that's what Jesus said when he would go and he would send the Holy Spirit. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convince the world. He will convict the world. What does the Holy Spirit do? 
George, you know that's not right. George, you know what you said. You know what you did. George, confess. Oh, God, I acknowledge my sin. Forgiven. Forgiven. Hallelujah. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness of God because we own it. See, that's what confession repentance does. We agree with God. The thief agreed with Jesus. We are guilty. You are not. We deserve to die. You do not. Forgive us. Forgive us. You're forgiven. And the other one continued to laugh and mock, just like his father, the devil. So when Satan laughs and mocks and accuses you, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to recognize what is from God, what is not from God. Number two, Satan's condemnation, it's kind of like general. He'll say something like a dark cloud. It's just darkness, confusion. And he'll say, you're no good. Did you ever have a bad day? Что ты не в настроении. That you're not just feeling very spiritual. You know, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. The wall is. <laughs> you hit your toe and you're jumping on one foot and you're quoting Psalm 103, bless the Lord, oh my soul. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You go to the bathroom and somebody's in there taking a shower. Oh, no. I got to go now. You go to the mail, nothing but bills. Той Василь приходит до всех. Bills, bills, where's the check? It's not in the mail. And then the enemy says to you, see, see, they say that God's going to bless you. You're not blessed. You're in debt. Your toe hurts. <laughs> you have to go to the bathroom. You hit your head on the wall. This is a bad day. This is a bad life. Curse God and die, said Job's wife. Well, she had at least reason to feel that way. We don't have any reasons to curse God and die. But you know, that's not the voice of God. Or how about these praroke? They come into a church, they're like, there is sin here. What, you could smell it? <laughs> oh, yes, God will judge. God will judge. Suit, 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 bunyat suit. On what basis? Do you know that from the time Jesus came to the day of judgment, Jesus doesn't judge? Did you know that? We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Yes. Do you know John 3.17? For God did not send his son into the world to yeah. condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. He brought... He said, I've come to convict the world, to show the light on their sin, to expose their sin, to write it with my finger on the ground so that people would own it and say, that's me. I did that. God have mercy to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that the sinner who prayed that, he went home forgiven. Somebody say amen. So Satan tempts you. He lies to you, and that brings us to the next thing. That condemnation is a lie. Jesus said about Satan, he, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't keep to the truth. There is no truth in the words of Satan. And when he lies, he's speaking his native language, narodny yazik. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You know that Satan will come up to you and say, there's no forgiveness for you. Oh, no, the Bible says there is. No, no, not for you. You have sinned the sin for which there is no forgiveness. He lies to you. He lies to you that there's no hope. He lies to you there's no forgiveness. He lies to you that you've gone too far. You ate a piece of the cake. Eat the whole cake now. You've gone this far. Jump in first head, head first. That's what he does. That's who he is. 
That's what he says. Don't listen to the lies of Satan. Amen. Listen to the word and the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know the difference, cry out to God and say, God, is this from you? And God will prove it that it's from him. Because Jesus said, you will know the truth. The truth won't kill you. It will set you free. Psalm 144.5. You know when I received that verse? I was 20 years old. I was at a youth conference. I was with my wife's husband. He's with the Lord, Ivan Popovich. Rosa Popovich is my oldest sister. We sang together for 12 years until God called me to pastor for 10. And I was 19 going on 20. And John was 31, 32. Is there a difference between a teenager and a 32-year-old? Yes. <laughs> Is there a maturity difference? Yes. And I was acting immature, and I'm an extrovert. He's an introvert. I got on his last nerve, and he just asked me to calm down. And I remember that I took it as an offense. I took it as, as a, a rebuke. And I went to the Lord, and I said, Lord, <clears throat> did you hear what my brother-in-law said? He hurt my feelings. God, what do you say? And really, I heard Psalm 141 in my mind. I, I don't know what's in one Psalm 141. So I open up 141 verse 5. It says, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head, which I shall not refuse. You too, God? You too? <laughs> but actually, when God tells us something, it's easier to take than when somebody, person tells us, Yes? So, God told me the truth. It stings, but it doesn't kill. It hurts a little bit because it's true. By the way, when people falsely accuse you, it doesn't hurt. But you know when it hurts? When there's a little grain of truth in that false accusation. Ot, o, i, piche. Wesley said, Lord, let me recognize the kernel of truth in their accusations of me. Now, the fourth difference between condemnation and conviction, and I'm about three quarters through my message, is that both have pressure. But notice, just click them all. Click them all on this page. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. One more. Do you see the black letters? No release. And do you see the white letters with release? That is the difference between pressure from the enemy and pressure from God. Before I explain this, let me talk to you about electricity. This is a good example. You see these bright lights that are above, on this, on the projector? There are wires running in this building. They are connected to a box, which is connected to a wire, which is connected to the main power station. But in the building, there is a box called the fuse box, right? Предхранитель. Предхранитель. Запобіжник в українській мові. Wow, what a big word. It's a fuse. The old ones used to be made of glass with a little wire. What happens is, if there's too much electricity, like in a Slavic wedding where they have 20 bridesmaids, everybody's curling their hair, blowing their hair, ironing their dress, what happens to the electricity? It goes out because it's an overload. Do you understand the word overload? Where the wires will start to burn. The pressure, the power surge is so great that the box disconnects to save the building from fire, to preserve the wires from burning out. Did you ever think what sin does to your mind? Now watch this. We are made up of spirit, soul, and body. But they're not divided. Everything you say, everything you see, everything you touch, everything you hear, everything you taste, right? You experience through your body first, enters your soul, and touches your spirit. You experience everything 
because you're integrated. You're one person with three parts in you. And God gave you a brain. Now, the brain is so delicate. It has a spinal cord down your back, and the branches go down your arms all the way to your fingers, all the way to your toes. Every part of your body is connected by what's called a nervous system. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Nervous system. Here, let's do an experiment. Okay, raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Now, before you do this, listen carefully to the instruction. I want you to take one of your fingers before you do it, and I want you to bring it as close as you can to your cheek, but like a butterfly touch, like a butterfly. Barely, barely touch your cheek. Come on, everybody, just touch your cheek. I felt it. Did you feel it from your hand? Imagine that the tip of your finger feels it. Your skin here feels it. God wired us, listen to this, for pleasure. God wired us for joy. That we would smell a beautiful flower. That we would see a beautiful sunset. That we would touch the, our love's cheek. Yes, our beloved that we would have married love that is a blessing and not a curse. That we would enjoy food. You know, we could eat hay like a horse. But God said, no, you're going to enjoy your food. <laughs> yes. So God wired us with delicate nerve endings that bring joy and pleasure and sensation for righteousness, for blessing. But Satan knows how we operate. And he says, let's accelerate it let's let's go crazy with pleasure let's get all the pleasure we can all at once with everyone in the wrong way in the wrong place in the wrong time and what happens we burn out our our conscience we burn out our memories we burn out and finally it's not enough to be with one woman we want to be with five women it's not enough to be with five we want we want to be with ten women and it goes on and on with immorality pornography with overeating and gluttony with drunkenness and drug addiction and murder and arguing and passion and lust and war James says these are desires that are out of control. You want, you desire, and you don't have. So you kill to get it. And that's what the devil does with the blessing that God gave to a body that has a soul and a spirit. So what is the fuse box? The fuse box is when we don't confess our sin, we burn out. Psalm 32, 3, when I kept quiet about my sin, my bones wasted away. I was groaning. Oh, why did I do that? Oh, why did I do that? Verse 4, day and night, your hand was what? Heavy. How heavy is the hand of God? Oh, baby, you don't want to know. And my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But what's the release? What is the safety mechanism? Confession. Confession followed by repentance. And then I confessed or acknowledged my sin. I didn't cover it up. I said, I will confess my sins to the Lord. And here's the good news. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the chapter 32 begins with this verse. Blessed is he whose transgressions, which means big sins, are forgiven, whose little sins are covered. Covered by what? The blood of Jesus. David wrote two psalms after his adultery and murder. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was his psalm of confession. I have sinned created me a clean heart don't take your holy spirit from me 
And Psalm 32 says, I acknowledge my sin. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ came not for righteous people. He came for sinners. Amen. And you know what the enemy will do? And this is the part I want you to remember tonight. Forget everything I said, but don't forget this. We're all sinners. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Satan wants to bring back your past sin. He wants to tell you you're not pure anymore. He wants to accuse you that God cannot use you anymore. That God cannot love you anymore. That you're dirty. Yeah, God forgave you. You'll go to heaven. But you, you, you have regrets. You have sorrow. You're living in the shadow of your past. But you know what God says? I will remember your sin no more. Hallelujah. As far as the east is from the west, I have taken your sin and I have removed it from you. How far is the east from the west? Infinity. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Jesus said to that woman, I don't condemn you. I forgive you. Go and make a fresh, fresh start. You know, it's amazing to me that God does not tolerate sin. He forgives sin. Amen. God does not justify sin. God does not allow sin. God gives no license for sin. But when we are humble and broken, God forgives sin. But the enemy says, no, he doesn't. Do you know that when you get to the point where the pressure is too great, then you lose all hope. No hope. And Job, he lost hope. He thought he would be sick forever. He thought he would die in his ill. But he believed that in his flesh he would see God. And then God said to his people in Babylon, in captivity, that he was going to deliver them. And I love this verse. It's not only for the Jews then. Don't say it's out of context. The context was is for them, but the principle is for us. God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Go to the next slide. What is the purpose of the devil? What is the, what is the bottom line? What does the devil want to do with you and your sin? He wants to kill you. That is his final solution, suicide. People who commit suicide, they have listened to the voice of demons who say, kill yourself, kill yourself, end it. You can't live this way. Finish it. You'll be happy in the grave. He's lying to you. The thief has come to what? To steal and to what? Kill and destroy. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But for both verses, here's the version that Jesus says. And Paul, I, the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that you may have life and abundant life. Hallelujah. The wages of sin is death, says Paul. But the gift of God is eternal life. I want to finish up with one more story. This is in a Slavic context. This is something Slavic people will understand, and hopefully non-Slavics will understand also. Let me tell you a true story that happened in my church. My dad was pastor for 20 plus years in Union, New Jersey, of a Ukrainian-speaking Pentecostal church, an Assembly of God church. His health got to the place where he would faint standing up, and he would have moments where he would black out. And so his health was such that the church began to seek for the, a next pastor. For the last five years, they were asking me to take my father's place. This is the church, not just my dad. And so I got married, took my wife on the missions uh, tour with me, with John and my sister, Rosita. And we both felt that our time for traveling was over. And we're going to start a family. And so at that same time, I had a vision while I was fasting and praying. 
and I saw myself between two mountains on a, on a rope bridge. And I saw that God was taking me from one ministry and he would take me to the other ministry. The next day, three brothers from the church board came and they said, the board is recommending that you become our next pastor. Would you be willing to accept? And I said, well, I'm praying about it. And they said, well, how much should we pay you? I said, well, you know, I'm making so much money. And they said, we will pay you what you make in your normal job. It was a lot of money. <laughs> and in 1982, this Slavic church, this Ukrainian church, paid me $3,000 a month to become their senior pastor. We had about 300 to 350 people coming to the church. I can't remember exact numbers of members. It was not rich people. It was normal immigrants from South America, like you. And they put my dad on salary for life, $200 a week for life, the rest of his life. And they paid me $3,000 a month. And I became their pastor. I was 28 years old. That was pretty young. But I was preaching since I was 16. And I was traveling, went to the Soviet Union twice already by this time. I just came back from school in Switzerland. And so 1982, I became pastor. So one or two years that I'm pastor, we bought a brand new answering machine. Oh, technology. You have a tape. I'm not in the office right now, but if you want, leave a message after the beep. And you press the button and you have a recording. How about that, right? <laughs> I want to tell you a funny story. Can I just, just put everything on pause? So Victor Limonchin, our good friend, he says, could you bring a fax machine to Kiev? Can I get fax? is from America and I don't have a fax machine so I went I bought a fax machine and it had an answering machine part of it so I brought it to Kiev I said Victor you could send and receive faxes but if you're not home and and people call you you they could leave a message oh how does it work I said well you have to say that you know you can't come to the phone right now don't say you're not home because in Kiev if they call you and you say I'm not home oh Dubai krasti. <laughs> let's go to your house and steal <laughs> say I can't come to the telephone right now okay so this is what he said in Ukrainian це Віктор Лімонченко я зараз не можу прийти до телефону але після гудка оставте ваше message сообщение beep this is Victor Lemonchigo. I can't come to the phone right now, but after the beep, leave your message. So he put this answering machine on his line, and him and Leah were at church somewhere, and Leah's father calls, his father-in-law. And they hear this message when they come back. Hello, hello, hello. Victor, як ти не можеш до телефону? Ти ж я з тобою говорю. Що тобі, криша поїхала чи що? Говори до мене. I'll tell you the story in English. <laughs> so the message says, this is Victor Lemonchiko. I can't come to the phone. But his father-in-law didn't know about answering machines. Victor, I'm talking to you. What are you, crazy? Talk to me. <laughs> and he left the message on there. They laughed so hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I come to my answering machine in Union, New Jersey, two years after I'm pastor. I push the blinking red button, and this is the message that I hear. Hello, Pastor. You don't know me, but I'm a young girl who became pregnant by one of the boys of your church. I go, oh, no. And I'm going to come in the afternoon because I want him to become the father. Our little boy is two years old now. <gasps> two years ago or three years ago, boy, Jimmy. And I'm thinking, Slavic church, bratia, oh man, they're going to crucify this young boy. This was my introduction to being pastor of a Slavic church. And I'm saying, God, 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 what do I do? What do I do? You know, he's guilty. <laughs> a child is born. They're not married. God, what? Sure enough, she comes in. And there's a little two-year-old boy. And I'm looking. Who does he look like? <laughs> he looks like her. So that didn't help. She tells me her story. And then she tells me the name of this boy. 
I'm like, oh, no, this is a good kid. This is not a, like a rebel or a wise guy. Or, this is a nice boy. Oh, man. He fell into her trap. So now what we're supposed to do? She says, I want to get married to this boy. I want him to be a father to this boy. I said, well, up until now, what, you kept it a secret? Yeah, nobody knows except my parents and his parents. And you kept it a secret all this time? I'm not a member of your church, but now I'm 17. That happened when she was 15. I'm like, oh, right. okay, I'll get back to you. So she left. I call his parents in and I call him in. I say, guess who came into my office? Oh, no. Pastor, please don't tell anyone. Let's keep it a secret. I'll do anything. Punish me, but don't tell anybody. So what would you do? <laughs> Pastor Sergey? what would you do? There's no good answer. If you keep it a secret and it comes out, I'm guilty with them, yes? If I don't keep a secret, I'm going to blow up this whole situation. And there are people in the church said, I'm not going to kill We have somebody to shoot at. I call the deacons in Bratsky Soviet, Braterska Rada. They're deacons. They're all older than me. I'm 28. They're 40, 50, 60. And you know what? They loved me. And they, whatever you decide, we will support. And so I prayed and prayed and gave me an idea. And this is how I handled the situation. But let me tell you this. During that time, God had me go to a pastor seminar where this very conservative teacher was saying how church discipline is necessary. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty interesting. Normally, Americans don't have church discipline. But he said, but be careful. There's two categories of people who sin. One category is people who sin and refuse to repent. You must remove them after warning them. Okay, that's what Slavic people do. And the second category is people who repent. He said, don't remove them for the church. Heal them. Bring counseling. Restore them. And you know what? I thought, hmm, interesting. But how do I do this? So let me tell you what God taught me as a 28-year-old young pastor in a Ukrainian church, a large Ukrainian church in New Jersey. I called this young man in my office. I said, we are going to bring it on communion Sunday to the church. <gasps> Don't do that. I'm not coming. You're coming. <laughs> How are we going to do this? I said, I know you'll be too scared to talk. So I'm going to give you five questions. They are yes or no question. Binary. You don't have to st stand up and say yes or no. What are the questions? <laughs> Number one, is it true that you have sinned the sin of immorality with this young lady, and as a result, a little boy was born two years ago. Okay, what's the next question? Next question is, you realize that you sinned against your body with this kind of a sin, and you sinned against the girl. Okay, third question. Do you understand that this is not a private sin because a child was born, so now it has come from the area of private sin to public sin? Because you can't hide a child, right? Otherwise, it's lying. Okay, fourth question. Do you ask forgiveness of the Lord and of the church body for this sin? Yes, okay. Fifth question. Are you willing to be removed from public ministry? Because he played in the band for a period of three months. And do you agree to meeting with me once a week for counseling? So I prepared him, prayed for him. It's communion Sunday. 
first Sunday of the month, like Slavic churches practice, right? The church is packed. More people came. Nobody knew anything. But more people came than any other Sunday. We had guests from other states. I don't know why they came. The Lord sent them that day. Guests to learn what's going to happen. We had, we had uh, that day I preached a sermon of forgiveness. <laughs> I preached the sermon of Jesus on the cross. I preached the sermon of, of, of how the Lord forgave. And everybody's, yes, Lord, that day you can praise God. And now before we're going to have communion, I have a very serious announcement to make. And we're doing this in two languages, right? With translation. Yeah, that's how quiet it got in church that morning. <laughs> Even the baby stopped crying. <laughs> it has come to our attention that a young boy from our church has committed the sin of immorality. <gasps> it happened three years ago, and now a little boy is two years old. <gasps> and everybody's like looking around. Who could it be? And I said, before I ask him to stand, I want to ask you a question. Do you understand that there's two categories of sinners in the church? Those who don't repent and those who are so sorry that they ask forgiveness of the church and they're willing to receive whatever discipline we give. Do you know there's two categories? I said, Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, there is a man who is sinning and you allow it. Remove him from the church. He's not repenting. But in the second letter, he said, he has repented. Receive him again because he's repented. And I said to the boy, I said, so and so, would you stand up? And everybody went. Whoo. And he's holding on to the pew with both hands. Right? And I asked the five questions. I said, is it true? Yes. Do you understand? Yes. Do you ask forgiveness? Yes. Are you willing to have three months removal from public ministry and meet with me each week? Yes. Sit down. <laughs> and I turned to the people. Before communion, I said, what do we do, church? Do we take a sinner who's broken, repentant? Do we throw him out of the church? He acknowledged it's wrong. A child was born. Now they want to make it right and get married. They asked me to marry them. I said, do we kick them out of the church? Is that what Jesus would do? What if we forgive him? What if we embrace him? What if we show God's love to him? Because he's asking for our forgiveness. Let's go to the communion. Do you know what happened after that church service? When I said the blahodat? Everybody went to that person. We have a crib. Do you need a crib? We have some baby clothes. Do you need some baby clothes? We'll help you. Everybody was going to him, accepting him, loving him. We didn't have anybody who was mad at me. <laughs> Not even the most strict people because we brought it in the spirit of Christ. Where's the love of God towards the sinner today? Where is the heart of Jesus to those who are broken? They want to throw stones, but they're guilty too. You know, the last verse says, you know who judges? Do you know who judges? Next slide. No. Next slide. You have no excuse. Do you know who judges the most? People who do the same thing in another area. When people are guilty, they want to take their guilt off and put it on some. Adam, what did you do? Huh, the woman you gave me. Eve, what did you do? Why did you put the serpent in the garden? Serpent, what did you do? <laughs> Nobody to blame. <laughs> blame somebody. Put it on someone else. Point the finger. Makes you feel better? Pharisees, scribe. This woman, this woman. You set it up. You let the man go free. You're using it 
for the wrong purpose to test Jesus. You don't care about the law of God. You don't care about people. You don't care about Jesus. You're guilty of worse. And you're full of judgment and accusations. And the devil is putting that in your heart. I think it's time to really repent if we're critical. I'm not saying to allow sin. Oh, no. We need to deal with sin. But the way that Jesus would deal with sin. Could somebody come to the keyboards? Can we do that? I want to just talk to you today. Where are you in this picture today? Do you know the devil has rocks in his hands? And all his demons would love to throw stones at you. All of the evil spirits would love to kill you. They want you in hell with him. With them. But Jesus... He's hanging on a cross and he says, forgive them, Father. Put their punishment on me. Receive them because I will be punished for their sin. You know, you can't punish yourself for sin. All you can do is confess and repent. Would you stand with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Don't look around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I never like to embarrass people. Because sin is so embarrassing. Shame is part of the guilt we feel. We're ashamed of what we did. So please, no looking around. This is not a public moment. This is a private moment between you and God. Do you have some sin that's not confessed? I'm not going to drag it out and shame you. No, no, no. I'm going to ask God to forgive you. But you must also ask God to forgive you. And you must do what Jesus told the woman to do. To go and sin that sin no more. If you're truly repentant and you want God's forgiveness... And, and it's an unconfessed, unrepented sin. Would you raise your hand right now and put it down? Yes. Raise your hand and put it down. Raise your hand and put it down. Yes. 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 Is there something you want to confess before God? We will not make you confess it publicly. Thank you, sweetie. Give it to God. Give it to Jesus. The devil has come to steal your joy, to kill your spiritual life, to destroy you in hell. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life in abundance. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Would you pray it? Everybody, even if you never have to pray it, but pray it for those who need to pray it. Dear God, come to you in Jesus' name. Forgive my sin. I acknowledge, I confess that I am a sinner. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. I repent. I don't want to go back to that sin. Make me clean. And Holy Spirit, come and live in my spirit forever. And let me learn to listen to your voice rather than the voice of Satan. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray to God, shall we? Why? Mold himself. Mold himself. Mold himself. Pray. Talk to God. Talk to Jesus. Now talk to Jesus in your language. Talk to Jesus in your words. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you, Lord, that you are forgiving. That you, Lord Jesus, Lord, you send the sinner home justified. Not because he's a sinner, but because he's honest and he re repents. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for this morning for the word of God. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, begin to work. And Lord, where there is sin that's unconfessed, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would go and bring conviction of sin. Bring truth, Lord, and set them free. This we ask in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lead us in a chorus. Whatever chorus is on your heart.